I was actually the second child my mother had tried to kill. I thought I was the first. A lot of the scars that you see on my head are from child abuse, not from fighting on the streets or war. It's the scars from being hit in the head with sticks and pipes and belt buckles. And I could tell I was getting to a point where I probably was going to die soon. And I remember sneaking into the kitchen, grabbed the knife, and I snuck back into the bedroom. And I remember standing over my mother and thinking, like, I'm, I'm going to have to kill her to have this stop. I realized, like, maybe I had another choice. Maybe instead of killing her, I could leave. I ran away and uh, at 11 years old, and I spent the next seven years, six or seven years, just as a homeless throwaway kid. By the end of that summer, I was having sex. I was in, officially in a gang, um, doing drugs like cocaine, alcohol, pot. Uh, I was fighting a lot, but kind of like forced to fight more than choosing to fight at this point. And instead of doing the two years in this new prison system, I did seven. Picked up more criminal charges while in prison for attacking guards. Was transferred 17 times because of my violence. Shortly after that, though, is when I was presented with an opportunity to uh, participate in some programming. My intention was to do the programming so that I could get out. It wasn't to change, I wasn't interested in how wasn't, I didn't think I needed to change. I thought I understood the world quite well. They had me look at uh, my abuse, since I saw and felt like a victim most of my life. Had I ever done anything like the things my mother had done to me? So you, you quickly realize, you know, the person you think you're so different from, that you would never, you could never be like, because you, you, it's not that you imagine yourself you're better than, you just really perceive that you're different from, you know, like I would never do that, I would never be like that, but you realize, like, I realized I had adopted many of the same values, but I had extended that to people beyond my home. I had hurt a lot of people in the community. They hadn't done anything to me. I had abandoned my own kids. So I had to admit in that moment that I had, I didn't have to, but I felt compelled to, that I had not only done what they had done, but perhaps I had done worse. I, at that point, I really just felt very worthless. I knew at that moment that I was going to um, change, but it was a really ugly process to change. Like I fought myself to change, even though I really wanted to change. There were things that were deeply ingrained in me, the hate, the violence, the aggression, all those things gave me power and control over my life. And I felt like they were the only things that gave me power and control. And now I realize I had to kind of give that up. So it was, I almost felt like I was choosing to die instead of to live, because I felt like the end result for me to be peaceful or nonviolent would be to die. So since then, you know, I've decided I wanted to uh, prove that I was sorry. I've just taken on uh, the executive director role for Life After Hate to help more people, one, know that there is life after hate for sure, you know, that there is a way out of uh, some of these lifestyles that have become such a major part of someone's life or narrative. From the white supremacy side to the urban uh, minority gangs, I am Sammy Rango and I am a hate breaker.